I'd like to welcome all of you to the final video of the Norway Chess 2020 recap series. It's been a lot of fun making these and if you don't notice, we got a brand new camera. I made an investment uh, into my stream and obviously my YouTube videos. Uh, I got the Sony A6600, got it fully optimized so now all videos will be in uh, 1080p, 60 frame per second stream. And I mean, I just want to thank each and every one of you uh, as well if you know if you started watching me just on Twitch uh, or you found me just on YouTube. It's am been amazing making content on both communities. Uh, I'm a little bit more instructive and civil on you on YouTube, on Twitch. I'm a little bit more wild at my New York sideshow. But before we jump into the games, I just wanted to you know thank you for making this possible. And obviously, I will be making bigger investments. I mean, I'm gonna get a better microphone, better lighting, upgrade the desk, uh, just to make the highest cost. Uh, highest quality possible content that I can. So just wanted to get that off my chest. Much love to all of you. Let's get into the games. Going into today, um, Magnus Carlsen was in first place and he was playing against Levon Aronian. Uh, and Magnus started the game out with Knight F3, which is already, again, unique. He took a page out of Ali Reza's playbook. Uh, but then it transposed into a uh, Queen's Gambit declined with Knight C3. A lot of lines here. Rogozin is what I would have expected from Levon, but he goes standard QGD. Uh, and Magnus takes, takes, and plays bishop f4. This is not super popular, this move order, but you see very quickly why he does it. So Levon goes for g6, trying to go for bishop f5, hitting the queen, and trades off the bishops. And now Magnus Carlsen continues the game with very natural development. No, nope. he plays the move h4. This is how you know that you are watching a game between two super GMs, because one of them has just played the move h4. And the other one plays a5. I mean, it literally looks like two six-year-olds that have never played chess are now just figuring out that they should get their rooks out. They actually have never learned to castle, so that's what they're doing. So we get king f1 now. Looks like an IRL mouse slip from Magnus Carlsen. a4 continues to advance on this side of the board. Look, the actual explanation for these moves is that Magnus doesn't want to castle. He wants to maintain the, the rook behind the pawn and long-term create an idea to play h5. Put the knight in the center, maybe even play g4, g5. Then he'll put his king on g2. Levon is trying to do stuff so on the other side of the board, so Magnus plays a3 and shuts it down. Queen b6 and queen c2 comes back. Levon plays h5 now to prevent the move h5 itself, but he does give up some dark squares, and knight e5 is possible hitting there. That's what Magnus does. He puts two pieces forward, but Levon just basically says, dude, yes, you can sacrifice, but this is just a draw. Uh, you're not going to win this game. I mean, unless I go here and hang mate in one. But I'm gonna go here, I'm gonna cover up with the knight, so check. I mean, I can just go back, but I can also just cover up with the knight if I really want to. And so, Magnus doesn't wanna do that, so it goes like this, and now plays rook h3. And here's a very important lesson for you. When you are under attack and you are facing pressure, especially against your king, you wanna trade off the most powerful attacking piece. You wanna trade off all the pieces, but you wanna trade off the most powerful attacking piece. And since you know this is about to happen and the sacrifice is looming, you play queen b3. This is an exceptional uh, move from Levon because if this happens, white has no attack anymore and nobody's really going to win this pawn. This pawn is very tough to take. If you go back, I mean, I'm just going to bring my knight forward. And actually, that's exactly what happened in the game. Magnus moves away from the queen and Levon sacks a pawn but plays bishop d6 with pressure on the queen. Chop, chop, check. Picks up the pawn. And we get this position. Material is equal, but black is better because black has a lot more activity uh, and very obvious targets like this. So the players shuffled around for a little while uh, and then traded queens. And then Magnus goes for b3. And essentially what Magnus is saying here is that with this sequence of trades, in particular with this one, yes, he's worse, but he can hold the position. It's rook and five versus rook and five. Black is better because Black's rook is very well positioned. It cuts off the king from coming forward, it defends, and you are the only guy in the position with a pass pawn. A pass pawn is a pawn that has no pawn hindering its movement forward. Whereas this one would be taken, this one would be taken, and even though a two on one would result in a pass pawn later, that's not gonna happen very easily right now. So the players start bringing in their kings. And here, Levon should not have gone for king e6. He apparently should have gone king d6, king c5, king c4. Uh, and then right here, he, uh, he also messed up again a little bit later. Should have maybe played f5 with the idea to play f4 and basically make this king have to go to the back rank or back this way. 
So Levon was giving Magnus chances. Like, this king d6 thing was really strange. Um, apparently, Levon here had to, like, go for some weird maneuver with the rook where he, he like, sets the path for his c-pawn. And again, as I said, here the move f5, according to Sessi, was, like, minus 7 or something. It was, it was the winning move because after pawn takes f5, um, he has g takes f5 again with this idea, and you can't play it yourself because of the pin. Now, in the game, he got f6, and Magnus brought in his king and his pawns, and sacked the pawn for a pawn. Now he has a passed h pawn. Levon plays the move b4. At this point, Magnus is equal, um, if he plays this the right way. Except he doesn't, and he takes on f6, and blunders something unbelievable. And yes, Magnus only had about two minutes, which is pretty rare. I mean, Magnus only having two minutes on the clock, uh, Levon having 25 or something. But taking naturally is apparently the losing move. Uh, and g5 uh, to go for pawn takes pawn and pawn takes pawn with b3 is, uh, is better. Not because you're going to go out this way to stop the pawn, because that actually wouldn't work. Rook a1, black is defending and, and covering you. You need to go stop the pawn from the b file. Not from the side, but you need to go check and king b6 and rook g8. And the point is that if I play rook a7 here, you have check, rook b7, take, take, and you promote g6, b2, g7, b1, g8, queen. You make a queen the second I make a queen. Magnus must have miscalculated with rook f6 because now his pawn doesn't get forward. And now b3 is simply winning because after check here, rook f8, you're not in time with this idea. You are now one square shorter. In the other variation, your pawn is on the fifth rank. So Magnus, all of a sudden, has to scramble back with his king and rook to prevent the pawns from coming forward. And Magnus here can't even stop with the king because of the beautiful idea of pushing. A lot of people would end their thought here with black. They said this doesn't work, but it does. Check here, discovered check. And I'm thinking that with two minutes on the clock, Magnus must have just blundered. I mean, I just don't know. I, I honestly, I just don't know what he blundered, but that might have been it because in two minutes to see all this is, is unbelievable. And after c3, and Levon brings his king forward, king here, king here, Magnus actually resigned apparently after playing this move, but this is lost because these pawns are too close. You're just going to win by giving a check and pushing both these pawns. And Magnus Carlsen loses a second time. So a couple of records broken. He still wins the tournament. We'll see if Levon gets second or third. Let's check out Ali Reza's game. But he loses rating. He loses two games in a classical tournament. And what's crazier is he loses in the final round of a tournament, probably for the first time since the candidates, 2016 or 2014 or 2014, I think that was, when he lost, to, uh, when he lost in the last round. Was it to Svidler? I think it was to Svidler. Yeah, Svidler beat him in the last round of the candidates. And Magnus also hasn't lost with white in a classical game in like 90 games. Something completely insane. So the second game that we're going to check in on is Ferruja versus Duda. Ferruja in this tournament, surging, doing really well. Yes, he had that terrible, terrible slip up yesterday, but doing quite well he, uh, otherwise and Duda having a disaster of an event. So the players start out with a totally symmetrical opening and c4, c6, b3. This is one way to create an imbalance. If take, you're going to go take. So take, take, c5, and bishop b2. And essentially, black is saying, all right, I've got some pressure on you like this. Maybe my bishop is going to pressure you when I move my knight. But Ali Reza is no, no, no slouch. He plays a very interesting maneuver here of bringing the knight back to c2. Knight on d2 defends the c4 pawn. And this queen, and like, somehow black's position is good, but he can't move forward. You know what I mean? Like, black can't move forward with anybody. And then, for the rest of the game, Ali Reza just very slowly improves his position. Bishop slides forward. Queen slides forward. Duda goes for a trade of bishop. Okay. Knight is gonna slide forward. You see, he's like making steady, improving moves with his pieces. Rook transfers from here to here. And he plays this rook, because this rook is gonna go here and pressure on the B file. Then he plays this very nice idea, E3. C4 is uncapturable with all sorts of bishop f1 tactics. Something like knight c4, rook c4. You have bishop f1, but that doesn't quite work right now because rook c1 and you can't take the queen. But more importantly, you have this move after rook c4, and that move is knight c7, 
with the fork on the queen and the rook, and your rook from c1 defense, so rook c7, uh, rook c7, rook c7, and you would win material, but still, bishop f1 is, is kind of another tactical idea here, uh, and also if you had gone e4, which looked very natural, uh, knight c4, and now you throw in the in-between move, bishop takes d5. Before this pawn got here, the bishop was protecting the bishop. And so that bishop would take and guard the knight. Now if you go here, the knight has no guard. Right? So that's, that's really the big difference here. But in the game, Duda did this, walked into e4, and had to go back. And he didn't go here because he was going to get hit with this move. So Duda, I, I don't know what he did. But then Ali Reza did a little bit of a weird thing. He, he traded the queens, and he's still a lot better, but he's, he's not as, it's not as good as it could have been. But he just, I mean, he's just on fire this tournament. And he just, I mean, look at this. He, like, takes all the space. He brings his king. A3, bishop f7, bishop h3. Brings the knight, tra tries to trade it off. And now two weaknesses. Beautiful move, c5. Opening up possibilities to bring in his knight. Now taking away the d6 square from the enemy knight. Brings his bishop back to cover that entire diagonal. Trades in the center and immediately goes for Duda's only weakness. Wins his only weakness. And knight g4. And here Duda resigned the game. He resigned the game because the rook is hanging and so is the horse. And if he plays rook to c6, you have bishop b5. If the rook comes back to try to defend, well, you switch your focus entirely and you go rook f1 check. King g8. Knight h6, and checkmate. And you have a ladder mate hidden in the middle of a game. So Ali Reza Firuja wins as well, and overall gains 21 rating points to go to 2750. He is now the 16th or 17th highest rated player in the world. People next on that list, Karyakin, Wang Hao, Lenier Dominguez Perez, even Anand is like 12th or 13th. Obviously, Anand not playing as much anymore, and especially, I mean, this year hasn't played since Waikanze, but just amazing to see that from Ali Reza. A lot of you thought that I was very harsh on him, I was critical. At the end of the day, I firmly believe that Ali Reza can challenge Magnus Carlsen for the throne, and obviously, a lot of you do as well. So credit to him. The last matchup of the day was Fabiano Caruana versus Arian Tari. Would Arian bounce back? He's been having an extremely rough event. Let's see what he can come up with against Fabiano Caruana. So a Rui Lopez, if you haven't watched my match against Chiu, you should do it. Played a lot of Spanishes. It's a classical main line here, and A4. This is more of a modern twist, uh, rather than playing C3, uh, rather than playing, you know, and allowing a marshal, rather than playing an anti-marshal. He goes for A4, B4, and A5. Now, still Black can go for a setup where he plays D6 and D5, and the player's got a pretty big main line position where there's a, a long series of trades in the center of the board. And ultimately what happens is black is down a pawn, but black has the two bishops. And so Tari m makes a slight error, actually. He's supposed to put his bishop on c4 or e6. Uh, there, This way he allows Fabiano pressure with bishop h6, but he brings the bishop back to e6 and Fabi takes it. So Fabi tries to make the game exciting by sacrificing an exchange. Uh, and getting this kind of a position where he has a knight and two pawns for a rook. The problem is that he doesn't have a lot of play. And uh, Tari correctly trades off his opponent's pieces uh, and then gets a queen trade. And just, you saw that? How quickly he, he, he crushed uh, Fabi's attack. Now Fabi's still able to do something very nice. Instructive moment here, h4, setting up an outpost on the g5 square. Now the pawns can all guard each other. The knight lives forever on g5 and the players just swap off all the pawns. Yes, Tari has the two horses, but he just gets it down to a king and rook endgame, and this is a draw. This is not a losable king and pawn endgame. Uh, players push for quite a long time, uh, and uh, instead of uh, agreeing to a draw, Fabiano decides, let me play on, maybe Tari will do something crazy like, like Ferruja yesterday. Instead, he just stalemates him. There was no chance for a win here. And we go to the final game of Norway Chess 2020, an Armageddon match, between Fabiano Caruana and Ari Antari. 10 minutes for white, 7 minutes for black, no bonus time until the 41st move. And if a draw is the result, then black wins. Another Spanish. Bishop a4, knight f6, castles, bishop e7. And now the overwhelming main line, even seen in the last game, but d3. 
Okay, d3. b5, bishop b3, and d6. Very, very mainline position. Here, white has a lot of setups. Main one is a3 with knight c3 and bishop to g5 fighting for the d5 square. But this just shows you the difficulty of playing super grandmaster level chess. Ariantari is 2640, 2650. He's playing against Fabiano Caruana, right? So here, Fabi plays a move against him that has been played in 50 games ever out of 5,000 games. And it's bishop d2. And it's like, what is that move even doing? Here's what it's doing. It is trying to avoid knight a5, and it's delaying the movement, excuse me, of the queen side. All right? And it's going to make him think, because the guy's only got seven minutes on the clock. So we get castles, and as early as this position, we have a position in the Rue Lopez that has never been reached. That's what Fabiano is trying to do. He gets Tari out of his comfort zone, so Tari can't come up with the best plan. And you see, knight a5 is usually the idea to get rid of the bishop, but bishop d2 cuts that out. And now he's able to save a square for his king, uh, sorry, for his bishop, transfer his knight over to this side of the board, and look at this. Look at what he does here. He voluntarily damages his own pawn structure. How rarely do we see this being good? But in a rapid game, it's actually really good. It's, it's really, really strong. The point being that now you will put your rooks on the open files, damaging your structure, but you're going to push, take away c5 from the bishop, lock these pawns in place, and you're just much better. And that's exactly what he does. And then he just transfers all his pieces to that side of the board, and a huge attack starts brewing. e5 takes squares away from the pieces. e4 is now up for grabs. Knight f5 with pressure. And it starts coming. Tari tries to come in with rook c2, but knight d6. The whole point here is to lock in the knight. Now another defender of the king has been removed. Bishop, whoop, I skipped ahead a little bit. Bishop g3 comes back. Actually, I think I skipped ahead on queen f6. Let's go back here. Bishop g3, rook d8, bishop h4, and this move baits the move g5. So now you come back and you're threatening this. So black has to go here. Queen e4 and queen b7. Look at that. Wins a tempo and throws the queen in on the other side. And oh, that's just a nice move. This move shows the big problem of black's position. You are now threatening rook takes knight, removing the defender of the d8 rook. And if here, just d7. And now you are threatening to take the knight and promote. So queen h5, he can do it now. Queen takes d1, sacking a rook. And a beautiful move here. King h2. And while you get to play rook b1 and say that you were a move away from defeating Fabiano Caruana, queen takes f7, rook g7, and queen f5 check. And here Tauri resigned because if he brings the king to the back rank, we're just promoting, and it's mate. You can also promote to a rook. You can also play rook e8 mate. And, uh, well, if you play king h8, I mean, it's basically the same story, but it's, it's a move different, and you have a lot of mates to choose from. Actually, that's not mate. Go here. That's mate. Do it this way. But in the game, we got queen f5 check. Ari and Tari resigned the game. Fabiano Caruana wins. And Norway Chess 2020 is over. Also big news today was the fact that the FIDE candidates are being postponed again. And the World Championship is being postponed again. I don't know what this means. Um, but hopefully it means that we get Anish Giri more on stream. Because it's been three weeks and that bum needs to turn on the camera. Just kidding. I'm a big fan of Anish. And we need to play some Among Us. So, if you're a fan of Anish, of Samai, get Samai back on camera, get Vidit, get Raja, let's all play some Among Us, or some four-player chess, or whatever. Let's just have some fun. Best of wishes to all of you. Hope you have enjoyed these recap videos, uh, and I'm very excited to make more content uh, with this super HD thing we got going on here. So, uh, much love as always. Two videos are going to appear on that side of the screen. You can check out all of my instructive playlists. And now that recaps are taking a pause, we'll be bringing out Rating climbs and all these things that you guys have been asking for. Peace out.